Welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green. It's Wednesday. We are live. We have a great show for you today. I was just chatting with Rudy Sarzo a little bit before we went on, and uh, he's got so many great stories, you wouldn't know where uh, to start. I had no idea that he had a communications background, that he actually went to college for it. He received his uh, honorary uh, a statue, uh, but he had to wait till after the pandemic. But he was such great stories. And if you watch interviews with Rudy or you watch him do interviews, you will see that he knows how to have a conversation. There's so many people who do interviews and they're just thinking about what's my next question. But Rudy knows how to uh, work with, with an interviewer and to get across the points you want. I will also point out Rudy is one of the kinder people you will ever meet in this industry. That's probably the biggest compliment you can give somebody, especially in the music business. Because uh, a lot of jerks out there, and uh, Rudy, definitely not one of them. I will tell you that we are broadcasting live today from Las Vegas. Uh, Going to talk about Quiet Riot quite a bit in the upcoming hour. Uh, before I get to that, I want to make sure interviews coming up tonight at 3 a.m. I got to get up because it's uh, Ireland time. I'll be interviewing Jeff Tate of Queens Riot and a lot of a lot of interesting things going on with him. And I've got some questions about uh, that camp as well. Mark from the Bullet Boys will be here very soon. Uh, another great interview. Jason Beeler from the band Saigon Kick will be here. Steve Riley from Riley's LA Guns will be here. Uh, go track by track of their latest album. And then uh, new tour diaries. If you guys like seeing my Stephen Piercy tour diaries, or it's really my tour diaries uh, while I'm on tour with Stephen, there'll be a lot more of those. And if you watch carefully, there are some cameos from Rudy. I am so uh, uh, fortunate that we get to play so many shows um, with Quiet Riot. And I, I really enjoy it. the next tour diary, you'll see it. I really enjoy it. Johnny Kelly from Tide of is currently uh, the drummer for Quiet Riot. And it's fun for me to, I grew up in New York City listening to Typo Negative, and it's fun to see Rudy Sarzo play uh, the Peter Steele bass lines uh, just a little bit for uh, Black Number One. So very cool, uh, in addition, of course, to his incredible career. So we got those things out of the way. I wanted to talk a little bit uh, uh, about, well, first of all, like I said, we're here in Las Vegas live. I would say I'm probably a mile away, uh, maybe less, stone's throw from the final home uh, where Kevin Dubrow lived and ultimately where he passed. It's a cloudy day here today. And so hopefully uh, Kevin is uh, watching along uh, uh, somewhere with us right now. We're going to talk today about the book, Keep On Rolling. My fan club years with Kevin Debro and Quiet Riot, and we've got a few guests. Uh, Rudy's going to kick things off with us, but uh, Missy Whitney, who was the fan club president for the band Debro and for also for Quiet Riot, she is going to join us, and she she's the author of this great book. And then Ron Sobel, who did pretty much everything with Quiet Riot, lighting director, uh, photographer, and uh, and then of course the legendary. Mark Weiss, who's been a fixture on the show. Everybody loves Mark, and he will be here in a little bit, uh, too. Everyone talks about their their collectibles, and people always tell me, I, I've built quite the memorabilia collection. A lot of times people told me, ah, what do you do with all this junk? What do you, what do you need all that stuff for? And sadly, 50% of the metal health lineup is no longer with us. Uh, rest in peace, Frankie Benali and obviously Kevin DeBro, but so I thought I'd show some of my collectibles. And uh, some of these are Mark Weiss photographs. This is a 45 that is signed by all four members of the Metal Health lineup. I'm almost positive. Yeah, there it is, it says right at the back, Mark Weiss. So we got that one. Here is a uh, Come On, Feel the Noise and Run for Cover 45, also signed by the whole band. And uh, let's see, Mama, We're All Crazy Now. 45 signed by the whole band and then this is funny so i have this folder and inside the folder you'll find a circus magazine signed by kevin old uh, school then we have faces magazine for those of you who remember that i apologize for the glare and then look at all these uh eight by ten pictures some amazing memories uh of the various years all this stuff in my personal collection. I really like this one. Uh, sorry, hard to focus, but, uh, and then this is a promo from the first album, the Metal Health album. There's always a debate of when does Quiet Riot start. For me, it starts at the Metal Health 
uh, uh, lineup. That's just me, though. Everybody's allowed to have. And so anyway, when Frankie was signing all that stuff, he kept signing all the way to the bottom, and then he signed the envelope too. <laughs> so you can't get rid of it now. It's a piece of uh, a piece of memorabilia as well. So those are just a few of the items that are in my Kawhi Riot collection. I wanted to share that uh, with all the people tuning in because I know we have so many uh, Kawhi Riot fans here. And of course, Metal Health signed by the band. And uh, and uh, oh, there's another Metal Health condition critical. There it is. So all those years that people thought I was crazy for collecting this stuff, uh, I'm quite fortunate to have it. So I don't want to waste too much time, even though that's the name of the show, but I want to bring in uh, Rudy Sarzo. So, uh, and, we'll, and we'll try to get to some of your questions as well. Okay, let's welcome uh, the one and only Rudy Sarzo. Jason, Rudy, how are you doing? You know what? Yeah. This is kind of like, this is like a show and tell. Mm -hmm. And I yes. rarely do this. So I'm going to show you my original 1983 Metal Health Tour. Uh, Stage pass. How cool. I, yeah, you outdid me. Yeah, very cool. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, and I've been thinking about wearing this this year because it's 40th anniversary of the tour. So I'm thinking like, should I take this on the road? But I don't want to lose it. You no, know? you, you got to keep it. It's got to go in the archives. Yeah. Maybe make a yeah. replica. Yeah, so Olaf gets to wear it again. <laughs> yes, let Olaf keep an eye on it. Rudy, can you, <laughs> can you believe 40 years? It, it's, it seems crazy. Uh, it, you know, to me, it's always now. You know, I can, yeah, if it's, yes, I can believe it because my perception, my alternate reality here is that whenever I go on stage with Choir Riot to play the songs, that, you know, because a lot of the songs like Flake Black Cadillac, when I play it, I'm transported back to 1978 when I first joined the band. So it's, to me, they're little time machines and just pushing buttons and I'm traveling to time and space and it's always now. So now I'm playing these songs and I am completely connected with, with, with what has been way back and, and, and connected to the future of it. So to the, next, the, the next show, I'm doing the, the same thing. I'm connecting. You've made it very clear that you do this to honor the legacy of Frankie Benali and Kevin DeBro. That you're kind of keeping that memory going. People were excited to see you back in that band um, to, to to bring some of that history. Yeah, and and I, I have to add uh, Randy Rhodes also because to me it all started with Randy. Randy was the first musician I, I ever experienced play with in a band that was born into a musical family. Uh, parents, both professors, they owned a music school, Musonia, which is still exists in North Hollywood. Uh, Randy was all about music, that's it. I never heard, we never talked about politics, religion, anything else but music. And that musical integrity was the backbone of what made Randy, you know, he, he's in the Hall of Fame by himself. That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the musician, yeah, all by himself is there because he was that unique. And I learned so much from him. So I take a lot of what, everything that I learned from Randy as much as I could, not only from playing with him in Quiet Riot and then I played with him in Ozzy. And that was a whole new level of musical integrity. I mean, I can tell you a story, you know, that will validate it. And that's what I bring with me as Choir Riot, as a member of Choir Riot. I bring, I brought that with me when I joined the mental health version. You know, musical integrity. I have been through that already, you know, and it was, it was, it's something to live by. And it's not something to preach because Randy never preached that to me. You know, you either, you, you know, he led by example. And when I live my life on, I, with every day, I apply, I, I apply what I learned from Randy, which is having integrity in everything that you do. Yeah, absolutely. R Rudy, is it true that you went to see Van Halen and couldn't get in, so you ended up seeing Quiet Riot at the Starwood? 
Yeah, I was new in town. This is 1970 or 77. 76, 77, 76, 77. Yeah, 77. And uh, I, you know, I couldn't get in. Uh, walked down the street and went to the Starwood, you know, and I saw Quiet Riot for the, for the first time. And <laughs> it was really interesting because, and I've done this in the past. I, I did it with Frankie also. But, you know, when you do something like this that I'm about to tell you, 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 you know, you do it from the heart, not because you see something laying a seed, planting a seed for the future. You just say, because, wow. So I, I, I saw the band and I got it. I looked at them and I'm going, wow, these guys really have a vision. They are basically an arena band playing in a club. And by then I have been touring around the country as actually with Frankie in, 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 uh, in, in, in this band that we had uh, from the Midwest. We were uh, uh, headquartered in the Midwest, in Chicago, and we were traveling that whole Midwest uh, market playing clubs. So I've seen a lot. And when I saw Quiet Riot, you know, I, so here's the band that they, they do their set, they finish, and then Kevin is wandering around the club and I go, bump into him and I introduce myself and I say, listen, you guys, you know, keep doing what you're doing. I've been, I've been traveling all over the, the country and you guys are really unique. So just keep doing what you're doing and you guys are going to, you guys are going to make it. And yeah, then about a year, yeah, that was that was the time, and that was it. That was the only time I ever saw Kevin. You know, it's uh, it's it's yeah, it's wild. I've had Kelly Garney on the show. He he's an interesting character. He talks mm -hmm. about well uh, why he was uh, asked to leave, if you will. He was childhood friends with Randy, but he had some problems with Kevin, uh, to say the least. And uh, you came in. You didn't play on that second uh, QR yeah. record. You are pictured. You did the touring. Uh, in the shows um, for it. Yeah. You know, I've been in situations where it's, <laughs> there's the bridge was burned so bad between the band and the person that I can, that I replace that there was no way to actually get back together again and have that picture taken, which is really a shame because I have to explain that for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so the other one was the uh, Diary of the Madman, Tommy Aldridge and I. Even though when we did that photo session, we were told it was going to be for the new tour book. That was because we were going back out again. That was done during the the uh, the, the uh, Blizzard of Oz tour, the very last show we did, and we were playing in uh, Daytona. So we drove to Orlando, Disney World, and we did that with Ross Alfin, and. We were going to take a month off, which we did, and then pick up the Diary of a Madman tour in, uh, in, in Europe, opening up for Saxon. And we were told, yeah, we're doing this photo session for the, uh, for the tour book. Okay, so here we are in England, and we go to the Jet Records office, and there it is, Diary of a Madman record, because it came out first in, in, uh, in England and Europe than it did in the United States. And I look at it and I open the sleeve and <laughs> there, there we are. And I tell Tommy, what's the deal with this? And he says, yeah, we're going to have to spend the rest of our lives explaining this to people. <laughs> and yeah, and, and it happens again with White Snake. I see so many people ask you to sign that White Snake record. You say no. Yes, but yeah. clearly it says in the back who is playing on that record. My photo is not on that record whatsoever. Yeah, and so when people bring it up to you, you you are quick to point it out that uh, that yes, you you they didn't credit miscredit you, uh, but it is something that. Well, uh, you know, I got I, I <laughs> a couple of days ago there was uh, there was some guy that was asking me a question on 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 Facebook, and he opens up with uh, I know that I I know, which is kind of like I was there, and I know for a fact that you did not play on the mental health record, right? So I go, okay. So I put, you know, I have a, a screen capture of, of, the, of the back of the record and I write him back and I said, well, fun fact, fun fact. I, I will, here's a fun fact for you, okay. And I, 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 I posted the, on the credits where it says additional musicians, 
-hmm. Chuck Wright played on two songs. Yeah. Guess who played on the rest? Yeah. Yours truly. Okay. So it's it's funny. It's like people will 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 have a perception based on rumors or or misinformation that's going on online where the facts are clear from the very first pressing of that record. Yes, and, but the, and, and obviously no one knows better than you. Quiet Riot has this thing. People love to fight which lineup, which member, who played on this, who played on that. Um, the, the, the band has had quite the career and, and different faces at times. But uh, when you came in to record for the Metal Health record, did you know that you would be staying in the band or were you just coming to, to play a couple of tracks? That's a good question. No, I just did it solely as a tribute to to the memory of Randy Rhodes. I mean, this we're talking about what's uh, September. It was the same week or the week before I recorded uh, Speak of the Devil in New York. So I was in town waiting to leave for New York to record with Ozzy and Tommy and, and Brad Gillis. By the way, one 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 thing that this book does it clears a lot of misinformation about what actually did happen you know because and it's clear here there's there's a fan fan uh fan letter that goes out announcing in october that in october the band dubrow has been renamed quiet riot and that i'm back in the band there's footage of kevin and me on mtv kevin talking about it and saying, yeah, once Rudy returned to the band, it only made sense to call it Quiet Riot. So there was really no Quiet Riot after Randy left in 79. It was all Dubrow. And that's one of the things that this, which I happen to have played in Dubrow right before I joined Ozzy. I played in Dubrow uh, until uh, April of, uh, okay, I, okay I, I got the audition March or April of, of uh, 1981 that's that's when i joined ozzy and then after i left and they got chuck after that yeah and carlos has told me that he believed that randy gave his blessing for them to for kevin to use the quiet riot name and, and to continue had you heard yes that? yes because he asked me too and i gave him the blessing but but it was it, there was no there was no quiet riot show between the last one that Randy did and the one that we that we're about to do, well, I think it was like 17 or 18 of March 1983. So to commemorate the uh, the tw the 40th anniversary of that show, that was the first Choir Riot, the Metal Health version of the band. Yeah, that, everything I, else, everything else was Debro. Yeah, right. But yeah, it's it's it, it. The book does clear up a lot of that. I should also mention Rudy has a book off the rails that's critically acclaimed everybody loves it it's been out for a while but if you haven't read it uh you can read that as well because rudy your own stories we're talking about choir riot today but you've had quite the life and quite the uh quite the career and so uh, i thank you for taking a little time uh i'm gonna see if we can get a couple questions for you uh while while we have you and then we're gonna bring in missy and we're gonna bring in ron and we'll bring in mark weiss uh again the book keep on rolling my fan club years with kevin debro and quite right. Rudy, uh, we're, we're talking about the 40th anniversary of Metal Health. The band is on the road a lot. You guys are working hard. I, I have to ask you in the celebration, and I mean no disrespect to Alex or any of the other members, have you spoke to Carlos Cavazzo at any point? I Yeah, the last time that we played together was in 2003. And ever since, every time we run into each other in public, nam show backstage at some show or whatever yeah we always talk yeah i think i saw the last time you actually were on the same stage together which was at rock and roll fantasy camp at the whiskey sebastian right. sebastian yeah. box singing yeah. quiet riot songs and you and carlos and for me to see that yeah. in the whiskey i don't think everyone appreciated how great a, a moment that is and and yeah. i know that you've You've always been a diplomatic guy. You've always got along with everybody. I, you know, Carlos had his, you know, they, they, the, that, the band was controversial. People didn't always get along. Um, 
but uh, it, I, you know, I, I always wonder: was there ever any conversation of him touring with you or celebrating this 40th anniversary? No, no, we haven't gotten into into that. Uh, you know, and I mean, there's 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 things that I've heard, but I'm not going to go forth and talk about because I wasn't there. So the only thing that I can tell you, as far as my experience regarding the 40th anniversary of uh, mental health, no, we we haven't spoken about that directly. He and I. Yeah, uh, as I've said, you've been on good terms, and uh, you know who knows. I I believe he's going to come back on the show and talk about the anniversary a little bit as well. You guys shared so many memories, and really at this point, you are the last two who can um, share those memories. And there's so much fun stuff. Uh, the song bang your head <laughs> originally being uh, uh no more beer right no more booze no more booze too no more booze <laughs> <laughs> it was a, a snow song uh with carlos yeah and his yeah and uh yeah. the guitar yeah. part is the same but uh yeah it's funny to to look back 40 years yeah. it'd be 41 yeah. years it's not recorded yeah yeah, but let me. Uh, do we have time for me to tell you the origin of the lyrics? Of course, we'd love it. Okay, so when Randy and I used to come home to LA on a break from Ozzy, we would always we land at the airport and go and pick up Kevin, take him to the Rainbow. Now you have to remember that 40, 40 years ago or more, we didn't have social media, nothing. So Kevin was really isolated in LA as far as what was going on everywhere else, such, such as England. You know, they was not aware of, you know, how Def Leppard was doing uh, or Iron Maiden or, or Judas Priest or Saxon, any of those bands, Motorhead, you know, bands that we were touring with, another band, Girl, you know, and especially Def Leppard and Girl was pretty the pretty much in the vein of what Dubrow was doing, you know, Kevin. So we used to get together with Kevin and say, hey man, you know, keep keep doing what you're doing because these bands that we're touring with, you know, they're doing pretty much the same thing and they're getting picked up by record companies. So sooner or later, LA is gonna wake up to that and you know, you're gonna get signed. Meanwhile, we were explaining to Kevin, hey, by the way, you know, we, uh, when we played in England, there is the fans are so crazy. They stand in front of the stage and they bang their heads on the stage while we're playing, you know. And so his wheels are rolling and going. Like, mm -hmm. So that's the origin of the lyric "Bang Your Head." He wrote about something that he completely imagined, have never really actually experienced that. Yeah, how amazing! Yeah, and. It is we amazing. Couldn't imagine it any other way, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Those yeah. lyrics and and the whole uh it's become a, a rite of uh, a passage. Everybody bang your head has become such a thing. You, you, to this yeah. day, you play that song, people know it. And uh, so yeah. it's great to hear mm -hmm. that origin. I will tell you, Rudy, and we're going to bring Missy in in just a minute. But uh, the, the, what I really enjoy about this particular book is it's a different perspective. So many people can write books. But because this is Missy as the fan club president, her personal mm -hmm. letters with Kevin, you get a totally different uh, um, a, a, a picture of what was going on at the time. And, and it's not your typical book. And then it's also very easy to read for those of us who, who don't read very much, a lot of pictures. Uh, what was it like for you when you first saw this? The, the memories must have been coming back. Yeah, you know, because you... This is a really good question because you brought something very important up. Uh, I played with three different Kevins. I played with Kevin, who, Choir Riot, Randy Rhodes. His goal was to put the spotlight on Randy. That's what he did, right? Now then, Randy moves on and you got Kevin. Now the spotlight is on Kevin. He's building himself up as a, not necessarily a solo artist, but a singer-songwriter. You know, because back in the day, it was very rare to get signed by, let's say, Billy Squire. You had to have the band, you know. And uh, so that was that Kevin. Then you have the Kevin that became successful, you know. And then again, being successful in, in Hollywood, 
in the 80s, you know, could be a little bit dangerous, you know. And a lot of the things that came down uh, that actually had an, a, an impact on his lifestyle and his personality had to do with the, with the pressure of success, really. But at the core, the real Kevin, the one that I lived with and the one that I played with in Dubrow and the one that I came back to play with in, for the mental health version along with Frankie. Now, Frankie and I, we have been like, you know, playing and touring for, all, for 10 years by the time that we went in the studio to record Thunderbird. You know, so Frankie was part, he was my family. So was Kevin. And these letters that are printed on this book really represent at the core, who Kevin Dubro was all along. Just yeah. a very sweet, caring person. What a great way to put it, because uh, seeing someone on MTV, and there was a lot of pressure to carry the flag. First yeah. album, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, number one on the heavy metal album on the charts, and uh, MTV, everything pushing him, all these other bands behind him. I, it must be a lot of pressure to carry that flag. And sure, mm -hmm. substances get involved, things happen. But uh, it, it, you do feel like you get to know a person who cares. And I'll talk to Missy about some of her very personal moments that are in this book that I really enjoyed. Uh, and so we, we will get to that. Rudy, I appreciate you spending a little time with us today. Uh, I hope you'll come back sometime. We'll talk more about your career today, really about the 40th anniversary of mental health and the keep on rolling book. I got to say before you go, Rudy, uh, I know that I'm younger than you, but I can't figure out how I look uh, 20 years older than you. You, what, what's the wow. secret, Rudy? Playing in choir riot. <laughs> and maybe some really the head banging. The head, yeah. the head banging brings brings the blood back to your to your head. Maybe some really good genes too. Uh, I think. Yeah, Levi's. Yeah. <laughs> Rudy, before you go, let's say hello to Missy because she's here. I want to. Hi, Missy. How are you? Hi. Great to see you. We we all got the book. We got the book. Right we now. all got our book. <laughs> uh, and thank Missy. you, thank you again for writing this. I know, I know, not only a labor of love, but a lot of time, and you know, you have to take time out of your life to put into this. You know, so we we really appreciate you, guys, you doing you guys that. Hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. I have to tell you that I've been trying to write this book for probably 10, 15 years, but when you work you yeah. and commute, you know, yeah. I, I worked at a, a talent agency for, for many years and the commute was horrible. Um, but during the lockdown, mm -hmm. I would go out walking every day. And then in May of 2020, I literally, I remember standing on the corner. I said, you know what? I think I should write that book. Now that I am decompressed, I'm relaxing. And so I literally went home and I set up a schedule and uh, I wrote all the memories I can think of in any any order. And it wasn't until later I put them in the best chronological order that I could remember. So if we didn't have a lockdown, lockdown as much as it was horrible to have the COVID situation, it gave me an opportunity to actually do the book. And now I get to see it. It's my baby. Um, it's that is my kid. <laughs> So, and I have to say, Rudy, even after all these years, you know, I may be turning 60 in a few months and the album came out when I was 19. I'm still I'll always be a fan of yours. I bow down. You are Rudy Sarzo. You are the well, teenager. You, we will always adore you. Thank you. Um, it, you know, what? all my friends and I, we went to 104 uh, Debro shows out of 106 and with a few quiet riot ones with Randy first. But we were there, and when you came back to the band, it was like, oh, you know, something so horrible as Randy dying. But then when you came back, it it just sounded like that kind of helped fill that pain of Randy. So I just yeah, want to say yeah. so much. I'm still a huge fan, even after all these years. <laughs> yeah, I, I really needed to come back home and play with Frankie and, and Kevin. And and. You know, it was great playing with Carlos, but I had never, I, I didn't even know him before we actually did the uh, the, the session, you know, for Thunderbird. So, but but he was great, but it, it was Kevin and Frankie that I really knew, especially Frankie. I I have been playing with him on and off for 10 years and we moved together to LA. And then after that, of course, I played with Kevin in the Randy Rose version of the band. I lived with him 
right before I joined Ozzy up until that time and I, and I played in Dubrow. So we were really, really close. I he have to family. tell you something. I have to tell you something you do not know. When you moved in with Kevin, at some point <laughs> in the back of that fourplex, mm. there was luggage, empty luggage with your name tags in it. And one of my friends took the name tag <laughs> because it was your handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> she still have it? I think so. I'd have to check, but I don't want to out her. <laughs> well, I think I think yeah. Rudy will let it slide. I, oh, I think so, it's, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, I I had two suitcases, and I had to like like put everything into one suitcase, and uh, <laughs> and that's what happened. Yeah. Like it's I said, amazing. fans first. Fans first. Mm -hmm. Rudy, thank you so much. I thank you so much. Everybody. I want to remind everybody to go see Quiet Riot on the road. My friend Jizzy Pearl uh, fronting, Johnny Kelly, uh, formerly of Typo Negative on drums, Alex Grassi on guitar. Uh, I've seen the show 20 times. It's great. The fans will enjoy it. And uh, and uh, I didn't get to questions, Rudy, because it's everybody just saying how much they love you, which is a great thing. So I appreciate it, Rudy. Thank you for spending some time. Can I ask Missy one thing? Sure. Missy, are you still in Los Angeles? Yes, I'm out in Canyon Country. Oh, okay. Because we're we're playing the uh, the whiskey on the twenty fifth of March, and if you yes, want to come down, I'm just gonna, I'm actually going to be meeting up with uh, Kevin's mom and um, oh. and our niece uh, before the show. Okay, but yeah, yeah I just want to make sure that you're on the list and all of that. Okay. Oh, very right. kind. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rudy. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right. Hi, Missy. Sorry we didn't get to say hello. <laughs> oh, don't worry. Uh, you know, nice to meet you, Jason. I, I, you know, it's funny. I didn't know about your show, but one time I was going through uh, YouTube and I said, oh, my God, somebody got an interview with Carlos Cavazzo. And it was you. And that's when I then later on, when I heard your name, I said, I know that name. And it's like it all kind of came together. I do want to say that even though everybody knows the mask, which people can get this, you know, as a quite right product through Amazon. My special thing is the actual mask that was used for the audience in the uh, Bang Your Head video shoot. The college That's made the great. mask and it had a little tie. It's plastic. Now, this was cracked down here, but they passed these out to the audience. And at the end of the video, everyone's wearing these masks and they're doing this. And then afterwards, we were supposed to return these to the college, but my sister kept it. So thank God my right. sister worked. Yeah, thank God she wasn't as good as me in returning it. And I have it, and there's a big photo of it in the book. So I do have some memorabilia here that no one else has. <laughs> yes, the, the, any of those original masks are incredibly hard to find and, and <laughs> obviously very valuable. You mentioned my interview with Carlos. Yeah, it is the only modern interview with him. I've known him for a while, and we've got along really well. He's very private. Uh, yes. He's not really interested in cashing in uh, uh, on things. Uh, uh, but he he was happy to come on. He had a terrible internet connection. It, uh, it was it, it was it was I was so bummed. But a hundred thousand views later, and yesterday we were tossing around the idea of him coming out and talking about um, his memories of the forty years, because obviously he was a part of Metal Health and whatever controversies or separation there is with Quiet Riot uh, aside. Uh, so yeah. anyway, I'm glad that you're here and. As I was saying, and the, you can go in the description and buy the book right now at the Decade mm -hmm. That Rock. We have the link. Um, but I, I, I really do mean it uh, when I say that this is a different approach to a, a book. There's mm -hmm. so many different people who wrote their story. But when you go through this mm -hmm. and you look at these these letters, and we can, we can scroll through a little bit uh, when the guys get on too, um, is that it paints a totally different picture. I really enjoyed the story about uh, Arby's. Kevin DeBro really enjoyed uh, Arby's, and, and so you talk, you talk a little bit about it. It's very funny. Yeah, um, you know, back in the starving musician days, uh, you know, Kevin lived in that fourplex, and again, this is during DeBro, um, and I he made a comment one time when we were talking. He, he said, "Oh, where do you work?" And I said, "Arby's roast beef." You know, I was a teenager. I, you know, I got my job at sixteen, and he's like, "Oh my God, I love the roast beef sandwiches. I love them, love them." So at that point, of course, it occurred to me that. Um, it would be fun to, you know, use my employee discount and get some of the roast beef sandwiches. And on an occasion when Dubrow wasn't playing, we were still pretty obsessed with Dubrow. So mm -hmm. what do we want to do? Well, I know what we'll do. We'll get in my car and we will just cruise down to Kevin's fourplex 
And uh, it wasn't about calling and bugging him. That wasn't what it was about. It was me and my sister mainly, because we lived at home and we just like to drive, roll down the windows on a summer night, feel the warm breeze. Uh, and actually one of the times we were cranking um, moving pictures by Rush. This is before there was any Dubrow demo tapes or anything. And we'd play, play that thing constantly and um, all the way there and dropped off sandwiches. And then we would just you know go up the steps, who's on the top left, drop off the bag and then we'd go home. By the time we got back, there was usually a message saying, oh, thank you so much. And oh, I love Arby sauce. You know, we threw packets of Arby sauce in there. So there was one time when I thought, you know what? I'm just going to get a whole bottle of the Arby sauce from my store in Northridge, uh, which is no longer there, by the way. It's been torn down and it's now wow. a, it's now a, um, a car dealership, which is kind of depressing. Uh, and we got a bunch of sandwiches and put in the, the sauce. And he was so excited that I gave him a whole bottle of Arby sauce. I mean, when you think about years later with what he can afford and the houses he's been living in, that bottle of Arby sauce, man, made his day. <laughs> so. Yeah, it, it's those little things. And as you said, uh, you know, you're, you're not always, uh, sometimes you're a starving musician and you appreciate the little yeah. things. Sometimes life is a little more um, modest. You know, I... I you talk about your sister and yourself and some of the experiences, and I don't want to give it all away. I want people to read it, but you talk about you're going to the Us Festival and some of these things. You watch the band rise from Debro into what's about to become the biggest hard rock heavy metal band uh, at, at the time. And so um, this it's, it's great. You know, some good things came out of the pandemic. Uh, it sounds crazy to say that. The, this show, well, I finally had the time. I went to school for, for broadcasting and but I finally had the time to do something. Well, you said you were sitting on these stories and uh, now you have the time to sit and write them. And I, I can imagine there's a part of you thinking, does anyone really want to see this? Or, you know, there must be a part of you wondering, really? Tell me. Honestly, that is what prevented me from writing it for the longest time. And you know why? Because just like the very beginning, the introduction, this is sex, drugs, rock and roll, minus the sex and the drugs. Because during this period of time, <clears throat> it was all about the rock and roll. It was all about the music. Um, I still don't drink to this day or do any drugs. Never have. Just wasn't something I ever got into. And my group of friends, the same thing. You know, my idea of a great drink is not a glass of wine. It's chocolate milk. <laughs> so I'm a kid at heart. Uh, so I thought there isn't a bunch of... Um, groupy situations, sleeping with the band or talking about people who were sleeping with the band. It really was about me and my core fan group that I kind of grew around me <clears throat> and the ways we can publicize and promote a band that for some reason back then I had never had a doubt they would make it. I mean, nowadays I can look at bands and go no or yes or no, but back then it was like, oh no, they're going to make it because they're so great. I just love them so much. That's just the way it's going to be. And so there was that, that, that drive and that focus. So my stories were really more about, you know, the, the, not only the struggle, but just the sheer joy of promoting the band. And yeah. Kevin, who was in the same headspace, we got along great. If, if, if something would need to be done, <clears throat> I'd take care of it. I mean, he would let me write the newsletters. And I was pretty young, so, you know, some of them are kind of silly. But there were ones near the end where I said, you know what, now that you guys are getting a record deal, can I have you review them? And he said, sure, sure. And then he would, you know, take a, I'd type it up and then I'd give it to him and he'd line stuff out and say, let's say it this way. But he was always, he was, he's, he's very easy to work with when it comes to that sort of thing. Um, he introduced me to his um, management company. I went into their offices. He introduced me to their bookkeepers and, and I would go to their office and he was really very inclusive as they were starting to take off. Um, never, I never felt like, like I said, he never got mad at me. We never got into arguments. I mean, what was there to argue about? We were on the same page at all times. And uh, I think part of me wanted to write this book too, because he, he did get a bad rap and a lot of people have problems with him. And, and uh, that's, we, everyone's discussed that to death. And I thought, you know what, why not just show them not by saying he was a good guy in other areas or other respects, just tell them my stories and they'll see for themselves. You the know? letters, the letters show that a very human uh, approach. And these letters go from um, 
the humbler beginnings to to the to the peak, and so you see that he was always very um, loyal to you. I will say, you know, you you warned this is not a kiss and tell book if you're looking for those. But I have to tell you, when I read the book, I thought to myself, did you ever, you know, he's a rock star, you're a young woman. Did you ever find an attraction? Did you did you, you know, was that a thing to you? Did you did you think you were going to date a musician? Good. That's a very good question. Yeah, very good questions. Um, I think there's that one section, Deer in the Headlights, that discusses a one time where um, I was propositioned. I was of age, <laughs> so everyone knows, because I did I did work with him when I was underage, but at a certain point I was of age. <clears throat> but um, I was that just scared me. I think because I admired him so much, and as we all know, he is a big guy. He's tall. He's just he's a big cartoon character that I never really thought of myself as dating. And also I didn't date at all anyway. So it wasn't like I was going to transfer, oh, I'll date this guy now. That never came to my mind. So when that incident did happen, I think I was just so in shock that I just couldn't couldn't process it at the time. And I just, the best thing to do was just say, yeah, and just act like I didn't know what was being proposed and, and just move on. And you know, he took the hint and got, you know, got it. Now, as far as being attracted to him, the guy is, you know, charisma times a thousand. And especially back back then, uh, just, you know, he's, you know, no matter what he says or does, he's just got, he just got charisma. And that's one of the reasons why I love the band so much, the charisma uh, about, you know, his whole personality, his whole persona. Uh, but there, I have to say, there was a part of me that always felt like, you know, this guy is so bigger than life. I doubt he could be a a boyfriend or a husband for that matter, because there's something about him that did, did and, it, and as time went on, you know, I've talked to different girlfriends and whatnot. And most of the time, the breakups are usually about him, you know, not being necessarily, you know, Hell yeah. yeah. And, and I, while I don't have the proof and this and that, but I had, you know, one, one girlfriend a long time ago, who I had no idea what happened to her and they lived together and everything. And, you know, we had dinner together and, and I heard her stories and I felt badly for her, but at the same time, I was grateful that I never took that path. If I would have tried to take that path at the stage it was offered, I never would have ran the fan club when they got signed because I probably would have been too hurt to find out in that capacity, we are not compatible. So I am grateful that I, I would have missed out on this entire time with the album getting big and, and all the fans and the fun and looking back on it rather than just, oh, wow, that didn't work out. And then I never had all this greatness. So fork in the path, you know? Yeah. And you and I think you're probably respected even more, you know, uh, and that keeps the, your relationship with him, you know, uh, it, 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 in a different level, because maybe if you went the other way, you know, as you know, he was a rock star and other people come and go. And you were yeah. a young, impressionable person, you know, it, it, to, to have someone, you know, become a rock star right before your eyes. I mean, he already was, but it was only getting bigger. Boy, that's got to be, you know, that's something. And and you're there. You're there for along um, for the ride, which the book documents uh, available now. So everybody can finally get it. We've been talking about it for a few weeks. It's available. We're going to bring Ron Sobel in in just a minute. Mark Weiss as well. Um, but I want to make sure that people get the book. They go in the link, The Decade That Rocked. And uh, I think that people will really um, enjoy this forward by Rudy Sarzo. Uh, Mark wrote, I believe it's the afterword. And there's just so many incredible pictures. We'll look at um, some more. I could tell you, I, I would see Kevin in Las Vegas pretty frequently. And I was uh, trying to get him to come play with a band that I put together called Sin City Sinners. And he was very interested. We might've been talking on MySpace. He loved to come out and jam. He loved to go to the local clubs. There was a club called Pinkies that he would go see whoever was there. Journey cover band, Kevin would be there. And he was very nice. Um, to anyone who wanted to say hello or get his autograph or, or, or whatever it was, um, uh, very unfortunately, after the exchange where he told me I want to come to this show, maybe in a week or two, it was right around Thanksgiving, unfortunately, um, he passed. And yeah. like I said, it's maybe a mile from here, probably less. I walk past the home um, quite often and it's very uh, sad. I can tell you that me and a friend of mine, we went to the house um, on the evening that he passed. I, 
it, 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 it might sound morbid, but it was this sort of strange thing of, um, it was very quiet and peaceful. And there was something about uh, thinking about Kevin and thinking where his last um, moments were spent. Can you tell me the last time you spoke to him? You know, I really don't know. I mean, I, I do bring up the fact that I try to surprise him in the book after so many years have gone by. I mean, because when you think about it, with all the social media and, and the, the fan base growing to how huge it, it became, the fan club was really about launching them. And we tried to bring it to the next level where I would run the fan club. Um, but the book discusses why that didn't happen. And I, I'm not bitter about it, but I have a feeling that that probably was a sign of the times, not to quote Quiet Riot again, <laughs> but the sign of the times in the sense that fan clubs weren't going to be a thing anymore. It wasn't going to be about writing letters and calling fans. It was going to be all on the internet. So it would have probably at some point dissipated anyway. Uh, but I don't remember. All I know is that they became so big and I was growing up. So I went ahead and I, you know, I got married. And so I started my own life. And it's one thing when you're single and you're young and you can go to all the shows, but when they're never around anymore and they're playing everywhere, um, you, know, you get sad because that was your entire life for a couple of years. Your entire life was going to these shows or promoting them. And now all of a sudden it's, you see the magazines and while he was on the road at the beginning, I would get phone calls, you know, about the platinum record or he'd say how things were going. So I think that when there was an opportunity, he would definitely make a phone call. But then he started getting involved with different people and we just, you know, you start going apart. So I can't really remember. I mean, I know I spoke to him when I got divorced uh, at one point and that's like the last time I can remember. And that was a while ago. And um, I wanted to surprise them and that didn't work out. And that's again in the book, why it didn't work out. And then he was gone. So it's tough. It, it's tough. But I think, and Frankie knew I was pretty upset about it. And he was very kind <clears throat> to write an email to me after the funeral uh, because he did not want me to feel like they had forgotten about me, that they they always had fond memories. They discussed them a lot. And that kind of gave me some closure just because of Frankie, you know, sending me that note and letting me know, which, again, is also in the book. So. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, I don't want to give away too much, and you do talk about that. And I don't mean to bring make it a somber occasion because the book <laughs> really celebrates the life uh, of Kevin and, and, and a side of Kevin that most people would have never gotten to see. I will say, and I'm gonna bring the guys in in just a second, uh, the fan club packages that you show in the book, you get a guitar pick and you get a, it, you were way ahead of your time. They, they, these were things that now are, are massive, it must be things, but I don't remember people in 1982 or 83 having a, 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 a all those items. And by the way, it was only $10. If, if anyone would have bought a few of those, you could probably retire now. Yeah. Well, not only that, but I actually, that wasn't just a random list. I actually did the budget of that. Yeah. I actually found out the prices from a catalog and worked with this guy. And I just, I was a little entrepreneur at 19 to make sure that we could afford to do it. And so I chose things that I wanted. I wanted mm -hmm. those things. That's, smart. that's <laughs> right. Well, that's the best. You have to have a fan's mind to succeed, I think, in, in the marketing end of it, because you have to know what they like. Uh, the bands you work with, you have to like the band. I told with Stephen Pearce, I like the rap music. I don't get tired of hearing it. Uh, other times you take a gig and it's simply um, a gig. I want to bring in Ron Sobel and Mark Weiss. I'll bring in Ron first. They've been patient uh, watching us. Ron, uh, nice Hi, to meet Ron. you. Hello. They miss me. <laughs> Ron also has an incredible history with the band Quiet Riot. You, you, you were sort of the uh, uh, back of all trades, if you will. Tell me how you got involved. Well, I got my stuff too that Rudy has. <laughs> yeah, look at that. <laughs> nice. Wait, I got one more thing. Yeah, yeah, of course. Like, yeah. Yeah. That is great. Awesome. When is that? When is that from? It's from Kevin. I would. I, I mean, doubt I mean, what, year, that, what year do you think that is, Ron? What? Wait, well, I think it's from the newer version, like when he was going out, you know, lately. Review, you yeah. know, not lately, but you know what I mean. It's yeah, not cool. I, I don't think it's from Metal Health. Still great, still great that you have it. Tell me when you first met Kevin. I met Kevin in September of 1972. Wow. Brother, what? That's amazing. And my brother introduced us because we both liked Humble Pie. So, uh, 
he called me one day and yeah, bring your pictures over because we're gonna trade photographs of humble pie. And I've told this story a million times. His stuff was so much better than mine. I you know I traded some things with him and thought I'd never see him again. And then he called me and said, "Hey, what are you doing?" And after a little while, we just became best friends. It's amazing. Yeah. Were you the lighting? Did you do lights first or photography first? How did, what, what did you do first with the band? Photography. And then the lights were so bad for photos that I said, let me do the lights. I know the songs. Give me a shot. And I started doing the lights. And then we just started bringing more and more stuff in. We brought in police lights. We brought in strobe lights. We brought a drum riser in with lights on it. So, you know, we started trying to make it like an arena show inside of a club. It takes the photographer's mind and eye to realize that that was what was missing. You, you, you know, you knew, you knew that that's what they needed. So you ended up doing both. Um, and Mark will be here in just a second. A lot of people know Mark's photography uh, and they know his book, The Decade That Rock. But a lot of these photos in the book, Ron, that are your personal photos, and there's some other people's photos too. I, I would think some of these have never been seen. Am I right? Until they were published. I'm not sure if any are in Missy's book that have never been seen. Ron, what about mental health video shoot behind the scenes? That's probably, is that in your book? I, I mean, I read your book, but you know, there's so much stuff. I know by heart. I've, I've read it a billion times. If it's in there behind the scenes, I don't think it's in my, uh, Randy wrote the Quiet Riot Years book, no. Yeah, because I think that you were there. And so those are the photos. Also, I'm not sure. You, I just saw, Jason, when you opened the book, it looks like possibly the photos taken at the party all night video shoot now that was that you that i was not at that must have been mark then yeah well hold on we, we, he's here why we might as well ask him mark party all night welcome hi, mark. Mark. uh yeah hey, Ron. yeah that was me that was me uh that's when uh i started shooting uh 83 84. Uh, mark were you familiar with ron's work when had you seen his photo photography when you were shooting them yeah, I mean, I I was aware because I you know I loved all that uh that, that early Randy stuff and I I loved the album covers with the locker room like that that was kind of an inspiration to kind of kind of uh what I did with a lot of the bands you know setting up a special set in a room you know a little bit of a fantasy so uh, I you know I was uh, inspired by it and and we met when he was doing lights and. Uh, couldn't take pictures because he couldn't take pictures and do lights at the same time. So there was a little opportunity for, for me to start shooting uh, the band and, you know, get some intimate things that he did. Cause I mean, you can't come close to what Ron did. I mean, I, I'm looking through his book, uh, the picture, like, it's just amazing. I mean, it's you know, to capture that, that moment in time. is just like, I, I don't think you could, there's no books on Eddie Van Halen like that. It's like Ron was in that in that place in the right time. It was the time, and we were best friends. And he happened to be with a rock and roll legend that ended up in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame last year. And Ron, I mean, you got to be like yourself, man. I mean, you know. And, and the access, Ron, that you had, no one was going to have the access that you did. That's for sure. But you know, in the beginning, of course, nobody thought that anything was going to really come of things in the very beginning. But then. By that, by the time things started happening, I was just always taking pictures anyway. So it didn't, you know, it wasn't like they, I wasn't intruding. You know what I mean? They knew me. They knew they'd get to see the pictures before anything happened with them. There's one thing that you talked about, Mark said about, yeah, I couldn't take pictures anymore. One time I turned all the lights up and ran down with my camera and left the light board and <laughs> at the Star Wars. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. It, you, you, it, doing the lights when photography's in your heart, you must have always been thinking, I got to get down there. Uh, that night I sure was. And, you know, I would take pictures also on the road. There was, you know, a bunch of pictures on the road I would take. And there was um, just some other, just, you know, stuff. If we played, if they played a gig where it was like, it, they were touring in the summer and the shows, a lot of outdoor shows, mm -hmm. a lot of festivals. So if they were on in the daytime when I wasn't having to do lights, I would take pictures. But did, didn't you want to do like like when you weren't doing that like sound check or like were you still doing that or did you just like you were zoned out of the photography at that point? You were I was just kind of zoned out on it. 
I would today like, and I and I kind of regret that I was zoned out on it because we opened for all these bands like ZZ Top, Scorpions, White White Snake opened for us. But you know, some of these bands, I I took a few pictures of White Snake, but I didn't take any of uh, ZZ Top. I took some of Iron Maiden, but I I wish I had, like you know I had all access. I should have been taking pictures of these bands, but I didn't. I mean, did you did you want to be a photographer, a rock and roll photographer, or you didn't even know what you wanted to be when you grew up? I wanted to be a movie director. You did, okay, yeah. <laughs> Same track. Yeah, if you go on YouTube and look under under K A M I K Z, you'll find my movies. All right, nice. Yeah, well, we'll have to do that and, and, and include a link so people um, can check that out. It, it is so great to have both of your photos in this book. We'll, I'm gonna scroll through just a little bit with people because I want people to get a, a little glimpse and, and Mark was nice enough to uh, share this with us. So just so, so we can see just some of this uh, amazing book. And uh, the first thing you'll see is Arby's again. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, Arby's used to be good. Yes, it's changed. Ever since they said we got the meats, it's not the same. Uh, but some of these photos that we're looking at, uh, uh, um, Rand, is this one of yours, Ron? No. no, actually, that's my friend, Laura. That was actually at the show. She's standing next to me and took this photo. Wow, it's, it's so amazing. And, and we're, we're lucky that everyone kept it. Here's some uh, letters. I was, you know, I was just looking for this record cover because I wanted to show, we talked about it. Here's Quiet Riot 2 um, that uh, Mark- Well, that there is, that, that's actually a huge billboard on the side of the Starwood. And wow. I took that photo from a stoplight in my car. Uh, Kevin mentions that in the letter. Uh, there's going to be a surprise on the side of the Starwood. So I drove down the Sunset, and right there on the left was this huge, that's why you see a please pay as you park all on the side of the building. So that was there, and I'm glad I captured it. I don't know if anybody else took a photo of that billboard on Starwood at that time. That's a painting of my picture of the album cover? It's a, yeah, it's huge, Ron. It was huge. And Kevin said they're putting that on the Starwood. And it was, and so I was at a stoplight. I was going to my job and I said, there it is. And I, in the picture actually is kind of cockeyed. And I just snapped a photo from my, my window from my car. And that was it. The only photo yeah. I have. I don't Ron, know how you I saw that. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Ron, you were there, obviously. You, you know better than anybody. Tell me a little bit about what it was like in the, in the, in the locker room, so to speak. You mean for this photo shoot or you mean yeah. just in general? Oh, for the photo shoot. I had this crazy idea of rock that, you know, bands play arenas and basketball and hockey teams play in these arenas. So the, obviously football teams don't, but I just had this crazy idea about the juxtaposition of these giant football players versus these skinny rock stars in the same locker room and, <laughs> the album was supposed to be called Second and Ten because their second album would, was supposed to have ten songs. I think it only has nine. But <laughs> man, that means nothing. They don't play football there. So they just called it Quiet Ride 2. And they still use the pictures for the cover. So I don't know. Where was that picture taken? Valley College. L.A. Valley College. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> Somewhere, somebody's probably hanging up their, uh, their their outfit, not realizing that they're in the record cover. The locker, okay. room, the locker room's still there because we shot an interview for my book and movie in there. How 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 great! I I love I love the locations. I talked to Mark about it quite a bit. I want to go to some of these locations with Mark for some of the covers that he shot as well. So it's cool that we we get a little bit of that insight. There's so many things. Uh, were you around for all these crazy stories about Kelly Garney saying he wanted to kill Kevin? Well, I was around to hear those words, but I did not. I wasn't there the night that the gun incident happened. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they 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 were fighting a lot. Yeah, Ke Kelly was on the show. He tells the stories about shooting the gun and the fights he had with Randy. They were childhood friends, but. Uh, it, 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 they had to make the change. And so you really lived all of this. We talk about the metal health lineup, only 50%, you know, two of the guys still alive. But we're going back even further. Um, that photo that you took, uh, you know, Kelly uh, before that and Rudy are still with us. But uh, Drew Forsyth doesn't seem like he wants to talk. You tried to get him? 
A little bit. I haven't pushed too hard. Some people say if you get him at the right time, maybe he would do it. All right, well, I, I got him in my movie because it, Drew and I were friends. I mean, we had a, we loved the Dodgers. So, like, I had a little, his, I don't know if the word isn't a history with him, but we had a friendship aside from music. Mm -hmm. So, like, we, we went to a few Dodger games. And, and, in fact, we've gone to games, you know, like 10 years ago. Obviously, quite right, way years in the past. So, you know, he consented to do an interview for, for my movie and, you know, because of the history of him and I, and, you know, we, you know, we hung out together as friends. Ron, we're talk about, I haven't talked about, about you. for a while, but we're friends. Talk about your movie, Ron. <laughs> um, I wanted to put it, well, around the time that that Randy movie was supposed to come out, I was talking to the people that were putting it out. And uh, he, the Andrew Klein, the guy that was the driving force of the of the Randy Rhodes book, the biography. If, if you're familiar with it, I saw it. I go, wow! Can you do a book for me? Because it was so great. And and he said, yeah. And originally it was supposed to be all the bands I shot, but I had so much Quiet Ride stuff that we said, well, nobody knows about Quiet Ride before. You know, before they made it big, let's concentrate on that, and we'll like talk about Randy before he joined Ozzy, and so that's it. Became first it was a book, and why the book's being made? I said, well, you know, I have a half hour's worth of Super 8 sound movies. Why don't we put them on a DVD and give it up as a bonus section to the book? A bonus, I mean, as a bonus with the book, and then I, and I said, why don't we go to the locker room and I'll introduce the movies the sound movies that were shot at Val most of them shot at Valley College. And so from there, I said, well, why don't we interview Kim, Randy's best friend? Why don't we interview Laura, Kevin's mom? Why don't we interview your brother? Because your brother was around. That My brother, Stan Lee, he's in a punk band called the Dickies. Yeah. He actually bought Randy's black SG that's now kind of sort of famous. And then... Um, he lent Randy some guitars for recording. So we ended up interviewing and the the other before Missy, the fan club president was Lori Holland. We interviewed her, interviewed her. We interviewed Jody Raskin. So we made a movie and a book out of that. And but where can we find it? it? Well, the movie's out of print. The book's out of print. If somebody wants to get a hold of me, you can get my original movie because my original movie now became this new movie called what's it called? Randy Rhodes Icon. It's out on uh, Prime Video, and so, and you can yeah. get a DVD of it. So half that movie is my movie. Gotcha. Okay, so people can look for it. Amazon Prime. Right, wow. Did everything I say just make sense? I think it did. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sometimes it All gets right, so <laughs> It's great, though, that with this book, it just shows you we can be scrolling, and we, we stop because there's a story, you know, for almost <laughs> – every page obviously but uh, some of these bring back some great memories and i'm just showing a little bit look at some of these um iconic photos of uh randy on kevin's shoulders I and believe famous, that's like the last reunion show uh the, the, the famous bow tie i mean you know uh, a great photo of, of uh the two of them together it, it really brings uh, uh, life to it. Some of the fun things about the book that I found also is that uh, at times Missy is talking about going to deal with management and she goes to see Warren and a lot of people might not know and I think she elaborates in the book but uh, the management was Warren Entner who was in who was in the band uh, Grassroots uh, of all things and then he would later manage Faster Pussycat as well which is why Faster Pussycat um, used Frankie Benali on drums, he's in the House of Pain. They edited him out of the House of Pain video. You see his arm. Uh, that video was directed by Michael Bay, of all people. But uh, and Frankie was very upset. I think the band felt that Frankie was a little older than them. But the connection was Warren Entner, their early management. Uh, let's see. Let's take a look at a little bit more. And again, the book is available. I don't want to show everything, but some of these photos, I just want people to get the idea. And with these books, and Mark... Uh, I just like the decade that rock. I uh, rock. I always say it's a good coffee table book. You can pick it up, and you can open it any page and start a conversation. And uh, I, I think both these books. This one goes is a nice companion piece to decade that rocked. Um, who, uh, who 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 came up with the layout and the format and the whole the whole thing? It's a nice book. 
Well, I'm going to I'm going to pull that person in right here and her name is Mikkel and she has, it started with uh, uh, a woman named uh, oh, Monica Rhines and uh, she started doing the uh, the layouts and then uh, uh, going back and forth me being a little bit too controlling and not really knowing what I wanted Michelle was looking over my shoulder where we share an office and said, you know, I can, uh, I can help you. You know, she didn't tell me she did Photoshop and design and web development. And then she, it took a life, another life of its own and turned into be this, you know, beautifully designed, uh, you know, book uh, with both of them and with Mikkel steering, you know, re-steering the ship, and bringing it to the finish line. As a photographer, as an artist, it's sometimes hard to realize we need to step away. I'm including myself with you you guys, uh, not quite as great. But uh, if you've done anything, writing, you, you can't be a good editor of your own work. So sometimes you have to go, I know I took great photos, but maybe it's up to somebody else to start to format and, and put it together. And as I said, it's a great companion piece. to Jason, Rock. Jason, Jason I have to say too, that the cover for the longest time the, the, the keep on rolling and the Debro and the quiet riot was all red and it was red 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 for the longest time and Mikkel came in and when she changed it to gold it was like that's it <laughs> so you know you think it's fine it's okay but it took it from being okay to that's exactly what we're looking for so it's it can just make the whole project a hundred times better. So when I saw that and they sent it over, I just almost fell off my chair saying that was the missing element, just right alone for the cover and the back cover. And then we had the, the printers make it gold foil and it popped. So I don't know, you know, all it takes is having one great idea. And then she does a ton of things throughout the book. I think, oh, that's a great layout. And then they come back and go, Oh, that's way better than the last layout. So the whole process was so fun for me to see it evolve from that will do or that works to, oh my God, now now we got it going on. So that, that's the element that's missing until Mikkel came in and she sprinkled her magic on top. So thank I'm forever you. grateful. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, Mikkel, for being here and gr a great job, absolutely. Um, for both that. of you guys, uh, it must be so nice to let the world see your, your work, to see your photos. Some of these photos, uh, you know, all in one place. Two great photographers, really iconic photos. Uh, tell me what it was like, Ron, for you when you first got to see the book. I thought the book was great. And there's actually a little story in there about that I had no clue about where Missy has a letter showing I guess what a fan club letter, I think it was, showing what, yeah, the what they were the considering album. for the album, yeah. And uh, Killer Girls, a song I wrote the lyrics to on Quiet Ride 2, was one of the choices. Oh, too bad it got canned. I have a few pennies if that was on the record. Yeah, it, yes, absolutely. Talk, talk about the title, Keep On Rolling. Explain to us what that really uh, is. I take it that's for me. Yeah, that's for you. <laughs> Keep <laughs> On Rolling. I guess Alex, Alex just found this out, too. He had no idea. Yeah, Keep On Rolling, uh, Kevin a letter that he wrote an all a new rock out song called keep on rolling and i'm like great and there was no demo yet so the first time i heard it was live and even with the you know the loud amps and everything in a, in a small club i just instantly fell in love with it for me i love all the lyrics you know no one stands in my way and and you, you know you gotta let your love's light shine it's like it just was a it almost felt to me he was writing about his feelings at the time of being Debro and and that elusive contract and that elusive becoming a rock star. And he was going to do it and was very determined, keep on rolling, you know, is that that kind of feel. So I started signing all the fan club letters with PS, keep on rolling. And uh, I always hoped to make an album. But then when Condition Critical came out and I heard Party All Night, I'm like, oh, let's keep on rolling. But it's not the same song. And, and I called him on that. I said, why? Why did you change it? He said, because the whole album had a certain feel and a theme. So I had to, I wanted that song to be on an album. So I needed to rewrite the title and lyrics to match the rest of the song. So that's the only reason why it changed. And that song is still quite fun, uh, but Keep On Rolling has a special place in my heart because it was the first. And uh, when I was out 
instead and thought, hey, you know what? I think I'll go ahead and write write my stories and make a book. And I went, keep on rolling as a title. It was like that was the first thing that was decided because of that song. And I want to I want to say that uh, you know Missy had mentioned in the beginning that she had a, the demos for uh, uh, like eight or nine tracks, and I kind of forgot that she told me. And a few days before we were doing this um, uh, virtual book release on Me Hook Live uh, on the anniversary of Mental Health, which is this past Saturday, uh, she said, "Do you still have that? Uh, do you have that demo?" And I. I didn't think much of it. And then I said, can you send it to me? And I listened to it and it, it was just from a cassette, but it sounded like the song. And I said, do you mind if we like play a little bit of it over, over you reading about it? So we end this, um, this uh, uh, virtual. virtual release uh, on Meat Hook Live that Keith Roth hosts with that song, uh, with her uh, reading the, the story and then playing a little bit of it. So, and then we play the rest of it over the credits. So we, you know, you don't hear the whole song. So it's kind of special. And, and you know, anyone that kind of goes there will get uh, a glimpse of that song right now. Plus we yeah. did news with Dee Snyder and Don Dockin and a bunch of people. I just that, that, it's available. This yeah. is going to be available uh, online, I think for all the guests today for $5 oh, yeah. special. Yeah. So, oh, nice. Well, hey, that's a good deal. So you guys can watch it. We'll put the link. It's Meat Hook Live. You can also search, uh, keep on rolling on there and find it. But go get it. it you'll have a fun time seeing some of the guys, uh, uh, as, as you mentioned, Don Dawkins, Stephen Pierce. You're talking about the Quiet Riot influence on them. Quiet Riot were uh, pioneers uh, it's, uh, several times in their career. So you get to hear the song and see that it's great that there's this little quiet riot family you know obviously we've lost kevin we lost frankie but you guys share so much stuff that maybe people haven't heard one of the things i also really like about the book is this isn't a quiet riot biography it, it's it's really the stories of missy's relationship with kevin as the fan club president um and the photos and the letters tell the story so it's not just a uh it's not just a quiet riot book, which is why I think it's kind of nice that you didn't use the red and that it's not, you know, a mental health error. Well, that picture with the mask, it's a, it's a different type of book. And I don't think you even have to be a quiet riot book uh, fan to enjoy uh, the story. I want to look at a couple more pictures and I know you, you guys have been hanging around for a while. I don't want to keep going. And I just want to say, Jason, that uh, if anyone, you yeah, have until midnight tomorrow for the $5 deal, because then it goes back up to 10. Not that, you know. Uh, and hey, we'll get, yeah, we'll get in on And maybe you're in the quiet riot uh, mood right now. Mark, uh, here's some photos here. This is one of your famous shots. Are these guys really naked behind that sign? Well, they were, uh, they had the towels on. You know, they had the towels on. They were just, it was after the show at the Garden, Iron, they were opening up for Iron Maiden. And I just, I just met them that day and they were a lot of fun. I said, let's do a sweat. I usually like to do a sweat photo after the show. And they were like, uh, all right, after this, you know, we're going to do, take a shower first. I'm like, all right, no, we got to do it before you get cleaned up. So we did the photo and then I followed them to the shower. <laughs> Look at Frankie. Oh. <laughs> you had all access. Is this the same day? Yeah, so we did that earlier. Uh, Frankie did all that graffiti for, you know, ended up being for the bang your head. I had no idea what it was going to be used for, but I have a feeling Frankie did at the time. Uh, they knew I was going to be there. I worked for a bunch of magazines and they kind of, you know, saw a good opportunity to get some photos for what ended up being the single sleeve. Yeah, how cool. And, uh, and you see so many people talking about, like I said, I'm just showing a little bit, but there's, there's so much detail from call sheets to receipts, uh, to uh, tour, tour itineraries, all kinds of things in here that you probably never would have gotten to see all in one place. Uh, and I'm just showing, uh, and it's a fun, it's a fun, it's a fun read. It's really eye candy, you know, all the colors and the layouts that Mikkel did. It's, it's, it's fun. It's a fun book. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and let's uh, let's take that out. Ron, uh, were, were you friends with Kevin till the end? Were you still in, in contact? Yeah, we were friends. We were friends till the end. He actually had all my Super 8 movies 
And he said, should I mail them to you? I go, no, I don't want them to get lost in the mail. I'll just pick them up. So because they were used for a behind the music VH1. Mm -hmm. So then he passes away. I go, great. What about my movies? <laughs> I call his mom up and she, she says, I don't know what you're talking about, but I don't see anything like what you're asking about. So I, I, she, I say, well, can I come to Las Vegas and see if maybe you don't know what you're looking for? I go to Las Vegas. I find nothing in the house. The guy that picked me up, a friend of mine that lived in Vegas, he's in the garage. He goes, hey, there's this tub of video cassettes. Maybe it's in there. Sure enough, it was in there. Then there was also, there's another, so, so I found the original tape. Then, but, I, but that was a tape of the movies. The original movies were actually on a reel-to-reel because -reel they were Super 8, like a little 200-foot thin uh, beige box, like a root minnow that held the film. So Kevin's mom is like trying to get rid of a lot of stuff, and she gave me, you know, some things like the mic stand. And so I'm over at her house, and she hands me another box. And I opened the box, and there's the original Super 8 movies. We're in that. I, I wow. can't believe it. <laughs> and and it, uh, how amazing that you're able to get it back because, unfortunately, someone passes. You know, his mother has so much to deal with. She doesn't know what all these things are. He probably had tons of stuff. Well, also, the house got broken into after he died, and a bunch of his clothes were stolen, and I don't know what else. It's terrible. That seems to be uh, one of these things, you know, they publish the address and uh, and people go, well, I'm going to, you know, break it. it's what a terrible thing. So hopefully some of that stuff turns up. But it's been a lot of years now. The, the only time like there was a year where we weren't friends. And because so when the when the condition critical tour went out and, you know, Quiet Riot was riding high and they said, we want you to give us the biggest light show you can possibly make like a thousand lights. So I came up with that and they ordered it up and we took it out and it was fucking great. But the tickets weren't selling and they had to cut down, they had to keep cutting down the light show. And then when the tour was over, it was like my fault. Well, I guess so. Cause I got fired. So I was really pissed at Kevin for like a year and then we kissed and made up. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, you, you had so much time with him that uh live together uh, for a while yeah that you're gonna see through things maybe if he, if his ego or whatever the things that people have said you're gonna see past that you were friends a lot longer than his than the stardom part of it right yes and generally if you're gonna be able to be friends with somebody that becomes that big generally usually it's you know them before they made it right and they know well, they not, trust you for any reason except you're really his friend. Yes, it, it's it's very difficult because people come out of the woodwork and uh, you had that trust. Missy, same for you uh, in, the, in as well. You were there in the beginning. You were you were loyal to this band. You were loyal to Kevin. Are you talking definitely. to me or Missy? <laughs> Missy, sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. That's why when you know I hear stories that weren't very flattering, I'm like, that's not the guy I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, now, now, Mark, when you started working with him, he was already the, the rock star. What we, what were your experiences like? Well, at that point, it was 1983. I was already like the big photographer at Circus Magazine, so all the bands wanted to be my friends because uh, I can get them in the magazines, you know. And uh, and Quiet Riot was just breaking. And the magazines wanted them. So it was kind of like, you know, we needed each other to, you know, to get the magazine. So they gave me the access and and they knew I could bring them the pictures, I let them approve photos. And then I started, you know, doing photos. Uh, they just let me in. We got along. We, you know, it was like having four new friends. You, uh, you're definitely accustomed to different personalities doing what you do and spending time with them. These guys trust you too because you've had access to people um, uh, that, that most wouldn't have had. Uh, so I think maybe, uh, maybe if he had a bit of bravado, it, it wasn't going to phase you. No, I mean I was always I was pretty like fly on the wall kind of guy. I 
I didn't, uh, I wasn't really boisterous. I just was pretty quiet to myself. I was just, I was just honored just to be in there. I mean, here, here, these guys are playing in front of, you know, a few thousand to 15,000 people. And, uh, and I'm there taking pictures and being, a, being able to hang out with them before the show, take pictures, even though it was just a new band, Quiet Riot, you know, I, they were, they were, they were on their way up and just like most of the bands that I shot and, I just treated everyone the same, whether they didn't make it or they did make it. Uh, I just, you know, love trying to help them, you know, get to that next level uh, by, you know, making them look as good as possible and and creating the image that they want. I just, I kind of felt that I knew what they wanted to, to look like because I, if I was them, I would want to look like that. So that's kind of put myself in their place and I want to make them look cool. And and they they got that from me. And they know I wanted them the best for them, and I would never put out a bad picture. Yeah, I think a lot of artists uh, uh, felt that way about your work. Uh, Trace is asking, where can you find the virtual book event? It's Meat Hook Live. After the show, we'll put a link. Uh, everyone participated in it, and uh, yeah, and you get to hear uh, what would become party uh, party all night in a, di a very different uh, fashion. I'm just taking a look. A lot of people uh, just watching and enjoying. If you have some questions, we can get to them uh, for, for Ron or for Missy or for Mark. With Rudy, there was so much uh, admiration. We, I couldn't even find a question to present to him. It was all just what a nice guy or, or how many times they've seen him. Uh, people really uh, think the book looks great. Susan saying that she just really loves all the book stories. Um, Skylar here for the chat. A lot of people uh, enjoying this conversation. I appreciate you guys uh, letting me into your world. You guys have the, this. You have the Quiet Riot family and the book family. It's so great to to hear the stories, and uh, you're you're keeping it alive. You know, uh, it, 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 it's strange. I, was Kevin fifty two when he passed? Yes. It, it feels like he would have been much older. He's had such a long career, and then when you stop and you say. Wow, his, his life ended at 52. He'll always be, uh, you know, there'll never be an old Kevin DeBro. He's going to be the legend. The, the pictures will be what we remember. Uh, and, and in some ways, that's a, a good thing. And, and I, I just want to say that if you, you guys go on onto Meat Hook Live and you watch this, make sure you watch the end. The end credits. Well, they interview me last after D and, and Mikkel's in the middle, but that's not why, because... After me comes Missy's read from the book, talking about Keep On Rolling, and then she reads the letter uh, that Kevin wrote, talking about Keep On Rolling, and then they play it. But the most special part of this that just is the best is when I went to Mikkel to Laura uh, Mandel's house and showed her the prototype of the book and put it in front of her, and I wanted to get her blessings. And I didn't. it wasn't even an interview. It was just here's the book and she just started talking and we were there for an hour and a half just looking at the pictures and every once in a while I might ask her a little question and she would answer it and then in the final hour of us editing this I said wait a minute what about that video that we did and uh and I just we just pulled the best parts out of it and there's about five or six clips that are just priceless I mean it's just it's just priceless um, yeah well everyone's got to watch uh, until the end, Scott would, wants to know, Ron, what is your YouTube handle? Uh, if you just type in like, here, I don't even know. I barely use it. But if you type in like <laughs> Str there, there's a type, there's one of my movies is called Strangler. If you type in Strangler by K A M I K Z, you'll find my spot and all my stuff will pop up. Okay, I'm gonna try to find the link uh, and make it a little easier. For people, another question for Ron that uh, from Adam who wants to know: Did you help Quiet Riot in the later years as well? You mean after, like what the way later years? I'm I'm not sure. Uh, when did your involvement first end? When Kevin well, left? It, it ended when I got fired. <laughs> what year would you say that was? 1985. So for the next year, I wasn't friends with Kevin. Then in 86, 87, we're friends again. Actually, there was something he wanted me to do. They did this 
Quiet Riot in the 21st Century, I think it was called, where they filmed it at what it used to be Gazari's, and then it became like the Billboard Club, I think. Anyways, that's a DVD you can find. And he wanted me to do the lights, but it had been so long since I'd done lights, and I wasn't familiar with the place there. I went in, and I go, you know what? You're better off having the house guy do it. I don't want to screw this up for you because I'm not familiar with the system. And with no rehearsal, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to, again, be the one to get yelled at. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, get, I get it. You, you, you had made up. You didn't want to go back again. Uh, and a lot of people saying they want to check out uh, your movies. And like I said, I will find that link. Scarlett would like to know from uh, Missy, do you have an Instagram? I do not. As far as you talk about, there's no Instagram, I don't believe. I think we have the Facebook um, is set up. Yeah, Missy is still have, a right? private. Missy's still a private citizen other than being an author now. Yeah, believe it or not, one of the best reasons about being a fan club president and kind of behind the scenes is you're behind the scenes. Uh, Mark has actually had to kind of pull me out of my shell to do a lot of these things because I'm like, I have to do what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to talk on these things. And I did a lot of that when we were doing the fundraising back in 2020, but uh, it's still been a while. But uh, yeah, no, I've always been the behind the scenes person. That's why the fan club is just, you know, behind helping the band, uh, like Ron Ron, and you guys, we all do the, the photos and the sound. We're kind of in the, in the background, you know, I don't want to be on the stage. So I usually kind of keep things pretty simple, especially with Facebook. One place, everything's there rather than having to post it everywhere. If anybody yeah. wants, you can find me on Facebook, Ron Sobel, you know. It's the easiest way to find me. Yeah, Ron, Ron's got uh, so many stories. We, we they got to find your book too, Ron. Maybe you'll come back and you'll chat sometime uh, about your brother, uh, some of your brother's work in the punk rock scene, and some of the some of the amazing stories. There's a lot. Uh, there's a lot. Today we're focusing on uh, Keep On Rolling and Quiet Riot. And Mark, I thank you for assembling everyone. Uh, Mark and I have been on an adventure the last few weeks, a few months trying to identify mystery uh, musicians and tr go, uh, and uh, going through archives uh, and, and the world somehow has been uh, loving it. So I'm glad that you're here. And a few people commenting that they really enjoy the Dickies as well, punk rock, uh, <laughs> punk rock legends. There's some story about Kevin and the Dickies as well. Can you tell me that, Ron? Um, uh, I don't know what kind of story I know when, Kevin was super pissed that they got signed before Quiet Riot did. <laughs> he was furious. Were, were, were they ever going to work together in some fashion? Well, there, there is a movie in my movie of them playing in somebody's living room together. So Kevin's the reason my brother's a success. Kevin got my brother to start to play guitar. He told him Eric Clapton started at 18. Well, I, I think Clapton started at like 12 or something, but... My brother didn't know the difference. So my brother sat there, played every day, was practicing. And then once punk started, you didn't have to be that great a musician to be in a punk band. So 40 years later, they still play. In fact, yeah, oh, play. absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's still, still very much available. Does he have the Randy Rhodes guitar still? No, it was stolen. Oh, my God. But whoever has it doesn't know what they have, I don't think. You hear these stories of things getting stolen and people, yeah, they don't know what they have. And sometimes you can, it comes into a music store and there could be a serial number, but uh, what a, what a terrible thing. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. Actually, you know what I remember after a Debro show, uh, during the show, Kevin used to have this black scarf. He tied it on his waist or around his neck. And, you know, it was one of his props. Uh, and at one point he came down and this is, we, we knew each other, but we hadn't started writing yet. He knew I was there every night in the very front. And he took the scarf and put it over my neck and gave it to me. And so of course I was going to wear it to every show. So I had it and wear it to every show. But one night, leaving the parking lot of a club, the window was open. Someone literally took it off my neck through the car window. Oh, Never saw it again. Yeah, it, it, so I got it, stolen right on right on my right off head. right off of you. Yeah, so uh, I had it for a little while, but it was gone. Uh, let's see, uh, uh, Joe Mannix, uh, not the Joe Mannix, but a Joe Mannix, says he saw the band The Bro in the ba in a basement on Santa Monica Boulevard where snow appeared. There's a interesting mix of things. Um, and let's see Sounds here. Sounds like Madame Wong's. Madame Wong, wow. Like 
Yeah. That's what it sounds like because they had a bunch of levels. In fact, yeah. uh, on the launch at the very end when they're playing Keep On Rolling, Mark has an image of handwritten three pages and those are all the Debro shows. I kept track of them in my handwriting. I look like I'm 10, but two shows, where they played and who they played with, those sheets are all the shows. We kept track of them as we went to all of them. I, I, don't have, I hardly have any Dubro live. I don't think I have any live Dubro pictures because I was doing the lights for Dubro also. Yeah. I have a ton. I uh, let's see here. There's a question, and this is a question that Mark has answered before, but what type of uh, work did Mark do after grunge took down most of the 80 ba 80s bands? If you could tell us, Mark. Uh, well, I thought that, you know, with my track record of doing all these album covers, you know, you know, multi-platinum albums, you know, Dokken and Twisted Sister and Bon Jovi, that I wouldn't have a problem, you know. But I, what I soon realized was grunge really didn't want anything to do with me because I was from that decade that they were against, really, it seemed like. But it really wasn't that they were against it. They just didn't care. They didn't care what they looked like. So I didn't take it personally. I just didn't put my energy there. So I didn't. I mean, Skid Row was still touring, so I was on the road with them doing uh, some home videos. Like, you know, they did Roadkill that I, I did. You know, I, I took my high eight camera and I, you know, traveled with them around the world. So that kept me busy for a couple of years. And then Kiss came back in 96, and then I started shooting them. Uh, and in the same uh, time, I worked for, since the 80s, I worked for a German magazine called Bravo, shooting, uh, you know, pop stars and, uh, you know, uh, rappers and, you know, anyone you could think of. And and then when the 90s hit, uh, I mean, I shot, you know, the, one of the first shoots with NSYNC and the Backstreet Boys, and I did Christina Aguilera's uh, picture. No Tour book and Gwen Stefani's album sleeve. Uh, so the '90s, it took me to the '90s, and then uh, this German magazine kind of kept me busy. And then all the classic rock bands came out. CMC had bands like you know Leonard Skinner and Styx, and they were re-signing these bands with doing home videos. So I was doing a lot of that. And then uh, I started branding myself maybe 15 years ago, maybe 20 years now and starting doing galleries and then it just started picking up again you know slowly but surely and, and now it's like you know eight years ago i signed this um book contract and and i figured it's time to do my portfolio so i consider the decade that rock like my first portfolio because i was so busy back in the day and it took me a long time to do it and while i was doing it i was also uh doing the gallery shows and selling my archive print uh, which I'm doing and uh, going to book signings, which I'm going this weekend. We're leaving tomorrow to go to Nashville for the Rockin' Pod. Uh, so that should be fun. And then I'll be in Jacksonville the following weekend uh, for another event. Uh, and, you know, just having fun. So it really, uh, 40 years just flew by. And it's like, you know, it's hard to believe. It's like, that it's all I did, uh, whether it was rock, rap, pop, back to rock, uh, and I and I did hit the, the Alice in Chains and Sound Gardens. I mean, I did shoot them, but it's not like you go on the road with them. You know, you do an assignment for a magazine and, and you try to gel with them and then you just move on because it's not your cup of tea, really. I love the music, but it just image wise, it wasn't what I was about. It would be great to see you guys uh, do an in-person signing at some point. I know Mark is on the East Coast, but boy, would it be nice for uh, a lot of the people from the history of this book to get together. Uh, I, I will have Carlos on soon. It'll be the, only, the se second only interview he's done. And uh, I, I, I'd like to ask him if he's seen it. I, 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 we'll, we'll see what happens. Because there, I, I enjoy, uh, there's a Q&A section in here that's handwritten, and it has Carlos's, uh, I have it in front of me. Oh, show. I love that. Yeah, that's that's so good. Read, read a few of those, uh, Jason. Who, first, I will, but who found this, first of all? It's oh, they're Mrs. mine. Yeah, this is yours. So these are from yours. Yeah, I see, oh, I see it right here. Yeah. Yeah, she uh, had it filled out. That was part so, of the job, yeah. Uh, they, they filled them out when they were on the tour buses. <laughs> for his favorite musician, he wrote Mel Torme, but then he crossed it out and wrote <laughs> too many. Favorite group, the Beatles. And when you, uh, when you have Carlos on, you should like ask him what the what the answers are and see if he matches them. Yes, I, 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 
Well, it says groups you dislike, and there are two groups that I like very much, Talking Heads and X. He, 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 I, I bet you he doesn't remember that he disliked them. Um, and uh, who do you admire the most? This is my favorite. The answer, beautiful girls. <laughs> and uh, favorite kind of car being a Ferrari 308 GT. And... Uh, the good thing is I can read this and know that uh, there's no chance he's watching right now <laughs> because he, he, he's in his own bubble. I remember when he was traveling with Rat, I was talking about how dysfunctional they were. Uh, and he was kind of like, you know, oh, I guess, you know, he, he, <laughs> he's managed to stay out of it. But uh, some of these are great. Kevin Mark Debro, his favorite musician, Randy Rhodes. Favorite group, Quiet Riot. He wasn't modest. Uh, and, and then The Who. And uh, favorite actors, Clint Eastwood and Lauren Bacall. Let's see who he, groups, uh, groups you were in before was DeBro. Groups you dislike, too many to, uh, to name. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and uh, his favorite track off the Metal Health LP, Run for Cover. That's a good one. A good question, you know. Uh, uh, Carlos, his favorite was Breathless. And let's see what the other guys said. And then we'll leave some for the audience to to, to read. But since it's the 40th anniversary, uh, Francis Felix Benali, he said uh, there's too many uh, too many to name on the on the record. And uh, I think that's it. I think we just have the, the oh no, here's Rudy. Sorry, Rudy Sarzo, and his favorite track was Run for Cover also, which is a great one. They open with that now. Uh, and a great heavy song. There's a lot of songs, you know, people know Quiet Riot for the MTV videos, but boy, there's a lot of songs that you can dig in and, and really enjoy. Uh, Rudy's greatest accomplishment, achievement, staying alive. And uh, yeah, and so uh, favorite musician, Jaco Pastorius. Anyway, this, this you can go on with this book uh, forever. And uh, I, I will we'll go around and let you guys have a, a last word. Start with you, Missy. Well, you know, we were talking at the very beginning about memorabilia that not everyone has. I know I pointed out that, you know, I had, you know, this mask. But speaking of those questionnaires, uh, they made the book because they were questionnaires I used when the band was signed and they were on the road. But I did have just two, Carlos and Kevin. They filled out questionnaires for me when they were in Debro, and they're different. So I have those, but they didn't go with the theme of the book. But I do have those in my personal collection. And, Kevin's answer at the end was pretty silly. Something like, you know, no comment, news at 11, you know, this kind of a really wild rambling thing. But I have those. But just from Carlos and just from, from Kevin. Now that I've said that, Mark's going to want to know about it so we can do and maybe share it with some people. <laughs> yeah, more more lost footage. Uh, yeah. uh, more, you know. We can't yeah. put everything in the book, you know. But, God, there was so much stuff. We picked the best, the best of the best. And that's what's important. So, uh, I think the last thing I want to say is that I'm grateful that we were all able to put this together. Um, Mark, I met Mark at, a, at the perfect time because I really wasn't going to make a book at all. It would be an ebook, and it was going to have my stories and my memorabilia, and I was going to put it a, on a Kindle and, and just tell my friends about it. The end, it was going to be something that would be very short-lived. And if I wasn't searching for the perfect book cover, I never would have met Mark. And ever he would never got Ron involved. And I haven't talked and seen Ron in a billion years, and now all the time, which is great. He never would have got Mikel involved, and I just feel like it was um, that little seed of an idea is is now turned into this book, and I can never. I'm so grateful for it, and I'm so happy because I don't have kids. This is my baby. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, well, that's very well said. Well, the baby is is going to grow up and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I have another idea that I didn't even have to tell Misty about yet. And this is very adventurous, by the way. Oh, yes. So this is a, a world exclusive. And uh, I see it, honestly, being uh, like a, uh, a biopic on, on, on Kevin, on how the trials and tribulations had this, this, this uh, musical prodigy, Randy Rhodes, come into his life. And uh, 
and even Ron. I mean, who's going to play Ron? <laughs> you know, and then, uh, you know, this friendship and then this mother that's just amazing when you watch this footage and you see her and what she went through and what she went through. Um, and then to lose his friend to Ozzy Osbourne uh, and then tragically get killed and then become the number one out. It's just like it's a window of human at its best it, it doesn't even have to be a, it's almost like a, a not even a real character and missy's story and this is by the way missy you're the main character oh, the, Lord. the story is you there's someone's gonna play missy. You. someone's gonna Mikhail, play can you Mikhail, can you play me <laughs> you know, we a 16 year old with red hair or, you know, a little israeli black hair <laughs> But uh, I see it as it through your eyes, Missy, and you're the weave from all this, and you were there, and you, you know, it's I'm I'm starting to write a screenplay on it, and I have some people that I can approach that uh, that it, it, this could this could happen, you know, and uh, Kevin, yeah, I, Kevin, do you hear this? Do you hear this, Kevin? <laughs> Yeah. The girl in Stranger Things, Sadie Sink, the redhead, she could play. Yes, great choice, Ron. Sadie Sink, great choice. Okay. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. The, the book is the movie, and it's a fresh take. Everyone's made the same biopic. If you're not careful, you end up with the VH1 Def Leppard bullshit movie or whatever. <laughs> uh, you have to... You know, yeah, that's a fresh twist and from a different perspective. I think the Elvis movie, I enjoyed it. I don't know about you guys, but I think what I like about it is it's not just about Elvis, uh, that it's about uh, Tom Parker's story. And Elvis happens to be in there, too, because how many times are we going to see the same uh, the same movie? So anyway, there's something great there. Ron, tell me a little uh, uh, bit uh, what you're up to and a little last word from you as well. Uh, well, first of all, anybody that wants to find out stuff they would not have known without reading Missy's book should get it because there's stuff in there that I didn't know. As I already said, one of the things was about the Killer Girl song. What I'm up to, I'm basically, once my movie came out, I'm semi-retired. I've got real estate that I'm involved with and, you know, that's kind of what I'm up to now. Unless Mark yeah. comes something else he needed me to send him pictures for <laughs> and we want to i just want to say something that this venture was uh it's mikhail and i started a, a a publishing company called mima publishing uh mi for mikhail and ma for mark and we're looking for projects of writers dancers uh, anyone with a vision that has not just a story but has you know memorabilia because it's got to be tied in it's got to be creative it's not just going to be an ebook. It's going to be like like the book we did. It's got to be something fun to look at and to watch. Posters. Grab and, my book. And and looking through um, Ron's book, which is amazing, but he's got so much imagery there and so much more, and that I'd love to. Uh, wow! Look at that. Yeah. Create you something. You said you wanted to re-release it. <laughs> well, we want to do more than re-release it, Ron. Right. You know, we want to re re. Uh, you know, give it a facelift and come on, you know, s flip it around a little bit and make it something uh, a little different. I'm and, down. If you want to, I'm down. Okay. Yeah, out, that sounds great, especially if it's out of print. And, uh, uh, you, you know, Mark and Mikkel are, are in the book world now. Decade That Rocked is a bestseller. Everybody yeah, loves yeah. it. We're, we're waiting for the same for Keep On Rolling. This is a brand new book. Uh, the, the event just came out the other day. So... Uh, I, I'm hoping that a lot of people will go check it out. And by the way, these books are also very uh, affordable. I, I want to make that point. I think sometimes people see a hardcover book and they think, I don't, I'm not, that's going to be a million dollars. But no, they're very affordable and you can get them. And uh, I, I think there's signed copies on your website, Mark. Well, Missy, why don't you tell about the different packages we have? Yeah. Yeah. There four so one of them is uh 45 and it's a book with uh, a limited edition guitar pick again what i would like to have so i wanted a guitar pick and it has the cover photo and it says keep on rolling on the back and then the next one is two 65 dollar one one is 65 um i'll personalize it and it also has a guitar pick and the other one is uh the mark 
um, special. And his is also, he'll sign it and then also have the guitar pick. And then there's the platinum package, which is we both sign it. He signs it, I personalize it. And there is a gallery printer marked, the one with the wrapped sheet, the and one right behind him, that one right there. Here. This one right I have one. There you go. Yep. And yep. also a guitar pick. And that one's the 85. That's the big one. So you have choices. If you just want to get the book and grab it, if you want some signed, you can. It's up to you. But yeah, you're right. It's a, uh, and go to the, the decades site because that's where you can get um, the packages. And they come, they get shipped out pretty quickly. I just sent out a few today. I get them in and I sign and I wrap them up and I ship them out. And you can't, get, right. you can't get it anywhere else. So you have to get it to the site and it's going to, you know, and the print alone I sell for fifty dollars. You know, my gallery prints, so uh, it's it's a good deal. Yeah, that uh, that link is in the description right now. So you want to buy it, you'll get it. We'll add everybody else's information as well. And, and so thank you guys, thank you, Missy, so much. I, I appreciate you guys, including me, uh, in in sharing some of these stories. I I tell people when you do these interviews, I've had some huge rock stars on, but I like a good. Uh, a good conversation and a good story. And I'm sometimes more interested in people that you haven't heard from a, a million times. You guys have had access to Kevin that nobody else has had. And, and, and you luckily you've documented it and you remember uh, these things. And I'm so glad that we got to share with our audience, Mark and Mikel as well. I'm so glad uh, that you guys were on and that we all could talk about this. Uh, and then Rudy, we should mention Rudy. He was here earlier. Uh, he had to get, he had to go. We couldn't keep him the whole, <laughs> the whole two hours, but it was so great that he came on. And like I said, Carlos will be back uh, at some point and we'll talk to him. And, and that's really what's uh, left of the mental health. Chuck Wright did play bass, we should mention. He did play bass uh, on, on, on two tracks on that record. And he is, he is out there as well. Thank you so much, guys. I got to take a nap so I can get up at three in the morning to interview Jeff Tate. <laughs> but, uh, hey, Jason, I just want to say um, thank you for having me on this is like my third time this month mm -hmm. and uh and 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 you got a way of interviewing people people feel comfortable and i tell you when you had rudy on and you started asking him those carlos questions i was like oh. <laughs> you know and rudy said so good and such a pro and he respects you and and he respects the question and uh you know not that many people would uh would would be so forth and and because we all want to know, you know, we, we want them to get together and we want them to hug. And, well, and, just know. between just between us and the thousands of people watching right now, I will say that that Carlos interview got me in a little bit of uh, a, a trouble. Uh, at the time, he uh, that Rudy was not back in the band, and at the time, he didn't like the idea of a band with no members of Quiet Riot, and uh, some people were upset and ruffled a few feathers. But, uh, you know, everyone has their side. I've had the other guys on, too, and, uh, and I respect them and their decisions. Uh, and, you know, you never say never as far as that, that involvement goes with Carlos and with them. And, you know, him and Frankie had some stuff. They talk, he talks about it in the interview. So, so who knows? And I'll ask him again. But I, 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 th I thank you, Mark, because uh, it is the question that people want to know, but most people would not ask it. I also uh, obviously meant no disrespect to him. Or, uh, or the band, and, and Rudy's a class act. We'll see how it goes when I ask Jeff Tate tonight uh, about Krista Garmo and Scott Rockenfield uh, <laughs> if they're going to form their own band. We'll see if I can, if that's the one that gets me in trouble. But uh, but I thank I thank you guys so much. Uh, yes. I, I really felt like you took us back, and uh, there's so much more. So uh, please check out Keep On Rolling, my fan club years with Kevin Debro and Quiet Riot, and uh, and and thank you, and I hope you all have a great night. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to everyone uh, for watching. And uh, please subscribe. That, that'll be great too. So thank you. And